I'm Michael Kane. Uh, I am a theme generator at Automatic. That's the company behind WordPress.com. Um, I tweet at Michael D. Kane and I blog at Map and Menu. I'm from Portland, Maine, just a short drive down. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about this introduction because uh, if you know anything about my WordCamp history, I normally sing myself in with Ovenland. Um, and so it feels weird to just kind of jump right into it. Uh, so yeah, as a theme generator at Automatic, I work on like a sub-team of our theme team, which uh, clearly has to do with themes. Um, I work with uh, Takashi Iria, the designer of 2015 and 2014, uh, and Tamagio, another designer, um, and then Kirk White, who you probably have seen on different WordPress TV videos and Jack Lennox, who is now becoming the REST API theming guru. So if you guys are into REST API, you should check out his talks from WordCamp EU and I think WordCamp London. Uh, I'm kind of the the man behind the scenes on the team, which really just means I don't do very much. Um, I'm a little more of a, develop, a developer than a designer, which is interesting on the theme team, because you think of themes as all front-end uh, design, largely. Uh, I was hired more as a front-end developer, and then over time at Automatic have developed into my developer role. Um, so today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about theme security. Uh, how many of you guys are themes, theme developers? How many of you guys are, let's say this, how many guys or gals are theme developers? Yeah. Plugin developers? Cool, cool, cool. So all of this will apply in one way or another to both of those areas. Um, and I'll start off by going over a few of our most common exploits that we see uh, in theme security. Um, that acronym, alas, was kind of awesome and unintentional. Little alphabet soup for you. So uh, cross-site scripting. Uh, or otherwise known as XSS, is probably the vulnerability that we see most often in theming. Uh, it deals with serving client-side code, often on the front end of a user's site, thus themes, uh, and can occur essentially any time a theme decides to process user input. Um, so if you wanted to do a custom search template or like post category filters, um, pretty much any situation where the user is supplying the input, uh, cross-site scripting can, can be a vulnerability. Um, defined, it is, I stole this from Wikipedia, uh, the world's most reliable resource, an exploit that enables attackers to inject client-side script, like JavaScript, into web pages viewed by other users. This is a very common test for a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, it doesn't look like a lot, but it's essentially a bit of markup that tries to close the, any markup that your script is rendering, your theme is rendering, and then it injects a broken image with a semantically correct fallback JavaScript handler of on error, and then it just alerts a null value. And you can, you can essentially go and start testing out your own themes, your own plugins, anywhere there's a form field or an input. If you were to input, you were to use this, um, oh, let's go do an example first. So in my cool theme, or Obenland's cool theme better, because uh, I like to pick on him whenever I can, uh, let's say that on my search template, I wanted to echo back the search uh, term that the user input. So they could see it and they're like, oh man, I meant to search for cats, but I spelled C-T-S. Um, I left out the A. So in this little bit of code, can everyone see the code? Cool, cool. Um, I'm just getting the search variable, uh, doing a fake function called search my site. And then if there are results, I'm either echoing back the number of results with the search string, or there were no results with the search string. The problem here is that I'm literally echoing back exactly what the user supplied. Um, there's no standardization at all. Uh, so it's a cool feature, but what if I search for this? Um, likely no results will be found, unless it's a blog about security. <laughs> then there would be re results. Um, but the page will try and render the image with that source of X, which is just broken. And so when the on error handle is uh, run, it will execute an alert. So if I'm a hacker and I'm 
testing out your website, and I'm like, hey, let's, this, this search functionality looks a little custom. So I submit a search of that, that test script, and if I, re return, if, I, if I get this back, I realize, oh, they're not sanitizing their input. Um, I know it's not very impressive because it's just an alert, but I kind of smell a vulnerability, so what if I use the following? Uh, now I'm asking uh, for the app session ID. So this wouldn't necessarily be applicable to the way WordPress handles authentication or current sessions, but if there's a cookie that's being used to, uh, to handle authenticated users and I submit this information, it will send me back my current session ID. A little more impressive, it's just a proof of concept. Um, the alerts are just for you and I. But now that I know that we're not sanitizing input, I can pretty much run any JavaScript in this prompt. Um, so, a short disclaimer, I really like my job, and .com, WordPress.com has a lot of protection against this, so let's just not try this against this. But let's say that in a hypothetical world, using Obenlin's awesome theme, um, I knew that he worked for Automatic, and that the theme team at Automatic had a theme with this vulnerability, uh, in one of their themes, so I created a web page with like a hidden iframe at the bottom of the web page. And in that iframe, I served up the vulnerable page. And then I convinced Obenlin to come to that page. Let's say um, I let him know that he had won a free bratwurst. <laughs> so he came to my website where it says, OMG, you won a free bratwurst, claim it here. But instead of actually sending him to a bratwurst claiming form, for his address, uh, I just take this this uh, link and insert uh, and use it to pass uh, the exploit to that iframe that's hidden on the page, asking for the cookie. Then I start stored on my own server. Um, in just a few minutes, I'm quickly becoming more and more like Obenlin. And this really creepy slide where like our our Facebook avatars merged onto one another, but it like kept getting weirder and weirder the more I worked on it. So I just we're gonna skip that. Um, long story short, that's a very basic uh, example, but, but cross-site cross scripting can pretty much allow uh, a malicious attack of any type with JavaScript, which is really interesting. Um, the next m common type of attack, we don't see this too much in themes, a lot more in plugins, are SQL injections. Um, SQL injections from Wikipedia are where malicious SQL statements are inserted into an entry field for execution against the database. Um, we don't see this in themes because, in my opinion, and I hopefully, hopefully in most of y'all's opinions, uh, you're, you should be using WordPress functions like um, WP Query, I guess a class, or, um, or like Git Pages or Git Posts to, to be querying the database. You shouldn't be directly querying the database. Well, let's say, um, for example, I have some code that queries the database for post of a certain ID. Um, I don't know why you would ever want your user to be able to find a post of a certain ID, but who knows? There are a lot of examples out there. This is a fantastic little bit of script and works fine unless your ID is this. Um, then instead of, it's not very helpful for like your post looking up function, but it's very ho helpful for my user lookup function. Um, I'm now inserting my own SQL into your database, my own SQL statements to your database to query against your database. Um, that opens a whole realm of uh, information kind of leaking, uh, which is horrible. Uh, and the final, final type of attack we'll talk about today is cross-site request forgery. It's a mouthful. Uh, thankfully, we have CSRF as a short. Um, once again, from Wikipedia, this is an exploit where unauthorized commands are transmitted from a user that a website trusts. Uh, let tell me explain this. Let's return to Obenlin's free bratwurst example. Uh, let's say that instead of the link uh, to to claim it here, passing a bit of malicious JavaScript to, to an iframe. Let's say it takes me to a page with a form that uh, in his theme, I know that he has specific options. Uh, Owen loves to share his work on GitHub. Let's say his theme has uh, the ability to s save a custom header or something like that. A, 
custom custom header, not course custom header. Yeah, and uh, and I saw on GitHub that it, it had uh, the vulnerability that he, he's not in escaping the input on there. Well, uh, in in his theme, since this is an option that's behind the admin, it should be safe, you know? Like, there's an, there's an off wall, so only Ovenlin or a user of Ovenlin's website can change this option. Right, but not really. Because uh, what if I knew what the form looked like and uh, the form to change the option? So on my website, I created a fake form uh, to I don't know, uh, submit your, your address for your free Broadburst, and then using hidden fields, uh, submitted my own information to his form. And then had him come to the website and, and click submit after he put in his address. Uh, the browser would then submit that information to his admin screen, his admin URL, and because it came from Openland, it would look like an authenticated user. Um, this could essentially let me do anything that... <laughs> that was an impressive sneeze. <laughs> uh, this could essentially let me do uh, anything uh, where there's a form that's not accepting, um, that's not sanitizing input. Uh, so, opens up a whole realm of, of, of issues. Um, that's kind of like a rough explanation of our three most common issues. So I guess the next part would be, what are the best practices and how do I protect my site? Um, there are a couple laws of theme security uh, or plugin security. Don't make assumptions. Um, only act on what you know for sure. Uh, don't trust any data. Uh, in the world of data, data is guilty until proven innocent. Um, so anything that can be filtered or user submitted can present a vulnerability. Um, and don't become complacent. Uh, web technologies evolve, and so do best practices. So we'll cover a lot of methods here to uh, make your themes and plugins uh, a little more secure. But this will change. Like It's guaranteed that as time goes by, more exploits will be found, and better ways will be found to deal with those exploits. So you have to continually stay on top of it. I'll give some resources at the end. Um, but first, I'd like to take a brief moment to tell you about my favorite file within all of WordPress. Um, it's a little bit of a link bait right there. But uh, reading through this file was one of those like holy smokes moments when I was first getting into WordPress. And I realized two things, like how much WordPress does behind the scenes, and then also how many tools it gives you uh, to use for whatever you'd like. Um, why write a function when there's already a tested and hardened, a tested and hardened one to to use to do it for you? Formatting.php. So uh, this is 4,377 lines of the most glorious code within WordPress, in my opinion. Um, do you need to return the difference in between two timestamps in a human readable format? There's a function in this file for it. Human time diff. Uh, if you need to capitalize every P in every WordPress uh, throughout your website, there's a function in here. Uh, capital P, dang it. <laughs> uh, do you need to convert an emoji to an image? Yeah, for like email or something like that. Yeah, there's a function for that too. All of them are in formatting.php and there are so many more functions, like pretty much all of the WordPress functions we're gonna cover in this section. So now that that brief plug is, uh, over, I think the best way to break up the how to protect my own website uh, would be to split it into three categories. Validation, sanitization, and intent. Uh, with validation, you're checking that the input is secure before you, uh, you use it in your script. Um, validation requires a list of criteria to check against. Uh, it's the equivalent of saying, I want the data to have this, this, and this. Um, in validation, there are two common methods, uh, or two tech common types of validation, whitelisting and qualifying. Uh, for an example of whitelisting, uh, you could use inArray. Uh, that's a, a function that will check the user submitted values against very specific values that you have. So in this instance, this is like a little bit of customizer callback code. Um, the, the function is called with the user submitted value, or user submitted option. And then if in array, I'm checking the submitted option against my two answers that I allow, uh, acceptable data one and acceptable data two. I know, pretty flowery, it's like. 
Um, yeah, and uh, if, if it is in the array, I'm returning that option that the user has submitted. If it's not in the, re in the array, I'm returning a default, which for me is acceptable data one. Um, whitelisting, you have to know exactly what options you're going to accept from the user. Um, qualifying is a little more of, uh, you don't know the exact values, but you can check against certain uh, characteristics of the values uh, and allow certain inputs versus other inputs. Um, here's an example of qualifying data um, where the exact answer isn't known, but specific criteria should be met. I'm gonna stick to my notes because when I like, go off, I get stuttery, so. Uh, we're using WordPress's is email function to verify that a user submitted information is formatted like an email. Is email is in formatting.php. There's also the PHP filter input function, which can take uh, a variable. You see submitted option is the second argument. Uh, it first takes the type, uh, the way that the, the variable is submitted. Uh, in this situation, we're doing a form post. Uh, and then you can pass it a number of different validation uh, methods. Uh, we're gonna do filter validate integer. And that's going to take the input that the user has given me, convert it to an integer, and then as an option, I'm gonna be able to run it through a range of integers to make sure that it fits within that. So let's say I want like a minimum range of 100, a maximum range of 1,000, default's gonna be 500, and I put in 1,001. Uh, the default will come back. Uh, if I put in 600, it will set submitted option to 600. Um, there are a number of WordPress functions to help with validation. Is email, uh, which checks if it is an email. Uh, WP validate boolean, uh, which it doesn't only just validate, it also sanitizes the data that's passed to it. Uh, if, uh, if the return value is not a boolean, uh, it, it will just, it always returns a boolean regardless of what the input data is, so either true or false. Sorry, I hope everyone knows booleans, I didn't really cover that. Um, if you need it to return um, like a null, if it's a string that can't be converted to true or false, I guess strings will always be converted. But if it's a value that can't be converted to true or false, if you need it to return a null, you could use uh, filter validate boolean. Um, and that's a little deeper. So sanitize hex color is another fun one that uh, will check against your user input, make sure that it's a valid hex color um, and return that. Sanitize hex color no hash is the same thing just without the pound at the beginning. Um, those are both used within the customizer, so they're not actually available outside of the customizer context, but they're very short functions, so you can copy and paste them if you want to into your own code. Uh, outside of WordPress, there are a lot of functions that PHP has uh, for validating, and since we're using a PHP app, we can now use those. Uh, is bool checks whether or not it's boolean, float, integer, numeric, or string to time, which is actually kind of cool just because it'll take your user inputted string and make it a time, uh, sorry. Uh, it, it'll make it into a timestamp. I lost my, my place there for a second. Uh, there are also the, we kind of covered filter input, uh, filter input array, which will accept more than one variable. Um, and filter uh, bar, which will filter the variable passed as an argument. So instead of like uh, input post, input get, so instead of like accepting it from a form, it will accept it as an argument from your script. So if I needed to use it in that customizer context, I would probably use filter bar. Moving on, uh, after validation we talked about, we're going to talk about sanitization. Uh, sanitizing data involves taking whatever the user submits and removing possible harmful parts. If validation is the equivalent of saying, I want the data to have this, this, and this, then sanitization is saying, I, I don't want the data to have this, this, and this. Um, you'll sometimes hear sanitization referred to as escaping. Um, they're kind of used interchangeably. Uh, 
Fortunately, WordPress provides quite a few functions for sanitizing user input. These are just a few of them. Most of these are in formatting.php. Uh, I figured we'd take a few minutes to deep dive into every last one of these. <laughs> that, that landed perfectly. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so uh, here are a few that uh, we use most often in theming. Uh, Sanitized text field is a really cool one if you're creating any type of customizer option or any, I guess now with themes, it's all customizer options. Uh, if you're creating an option that, that has just a text input and you want to do things like uh, remove the tags, uh, remove white space from the end, um, remove tabs and line breaks, convert characters to their HTML entities, um, it, it really just like takes whatever the user is and, and strips out a lot of extra stuff. Uh, it, it can be used in, in code just like this. So um, in a form that we've submitted the submitted value with uh, post, um, we're just gonna sanitize the text field, set it as submitted value and return it. Um, it can also be used in output. So that previous example was input before we save it to the database, but you can use it in output, which is uh, if you remember uh, my cross-site scripting vulnerability of OpenLens um, to prevent uh, me from being able to inject malicious code that will be rendered in the browser. Um, you can you can use pretty much all of these functions on output. Um, awesome. Uh, apps int is a wrapper for PHP's int val and apps apps function. Those are it's a weird word to say. Uh, it essentially turns whatever data has been submitted into an integer and then uh, makes sure that it makes sure that it is an absolute integer, so zero or well, zero. Um, uh, invalid data will be returned as zero. So uh, it's a pretty handy fa function for um, checking against like post IDs. Um, escape HTML is, uh, there are a number of escape name functions if you Look at that list right there, um, starting like halfway through. Uh, escape, escape HTML will allow, well, essentially all the escape functions will encode uh, greater than, less than symbols, uh, ampersands, quotes, single quotes. They'll make them all into their HTML entities. So if I were to submit to a form this as my name, um, this is how it will be saved. Uh, or this is how it will be output instead of, which looks like this inside the browser instead of this. So it, it essentially escapes it out to where it, it, it's, it looks like mark, it's so weird to say this, it looks like markup, but it's not executed markup. It looks like markup to you and I, but it's not executed markup inside the browser. Um, that's, that's, I said it was weird to say, but then it, it wasn't that weird. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in our, our cross-site scripting vulnerability test of earlier, um, this input will just be printed like this, um, and not that. Pretty easy to, to, to implement into our custom search template functionality. Just escape HTML on output. Uh, notice that when sanitizing output, I always escape at the latest possible point. Um, in a short example like this, it's really easy to see if I have escaped my output um, or if I've escaped the, the variable that, that needs to be escaped. But let's say like my code was a thousand lines long and I escaped on the get instead of, uh, instead of at the output. Um, even though it's been escaped, I'm not quite sure if it has, so if I have like 30 different ways to output this, uh, there's no real way. I, it, it saves like having to duplicate escape HTML in your code, but it's, it's a lot easier to track if you just wait until the latest path possible moment to escape output. Not to mention if, if like that variable was filtered at any point inside the code in between retrieving it and outputting it, that's an exploit. Um, cool. Uh, like I said, there are a number of different varieties to the escape functions. Um, escape HTML escapes HTML <laughs> for pretty much any instance where you don't want markup to execute. Uh, escape attribute encodes entities uh, to be used inside HTML tags. So if you have like a, an image tag with like a um, with like a, an alt tag inside of it or a title tag inside of it, you would use escape attribute um, if, if you have a dynamic variable inside of 
that tag. Um, Escape.js can be used to sanitize values for use in JavaScript, like if you're using um, your PHP in line with your job, or if you're using JavaScript in line and executing PHP inside of it, or if you're using WP localized script, uh, you can escape your JS before you pass um, that variable to your JavaScript. Um, escape URLs, sanitize URLs uh, for, play, for use in places like source tags, um, and have this cool little argument for protocol. Um, so like HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, mail to, news, IRC, gopher, NNTP, fee, telnet, MMS. I don't even know what half of these are, which is pretty fantastic. There's even a fax protocol. Um, I wonder when that'll get deprecated. Um, so, uh, yeah, exactly, never. Um, so I feel like I just duplicated this slide by accident. Uh, if we go back, there's one other function I'd like to to cover as far as uh, sanitizing output goes. And if you would go back to that SQL injection um, vulnerability earlier, uh, where I was just using ID and then I used a little bit of SQL to, to query against the database, I can use WPDB prepare, which is another function within the WPDB class, I guess another method within the class, that will uh, pass the variable through a number of checks, but essentially make sure that there's no malicious SQL inside that, that variable. Um, like I said, probably won't encounter that a lot with uh, theming, uh, but maybe a lot more with plugins, so we can talk about that a little later. Probably gonna have to query someone in the crowd for help there. Anyways, the last, the last of the categories for how to keep your uh, theme or plugin secure is uh, intent. So in the cross-site request forgery example, where I had kind of that faked form that I was using Ovenland to submit as a super admin on his website, um, I guess, how would I check uh, whether or not he intended to submit that form? Um, WordPress used to use a URL refer uh, to check whether or not, so um, when you submit a form uh, with the URL, your browser says, hey, this came from uh, canesfreebroadwurst.com. Um, and so when it was submitted to openland.it slash WP admin slash theme options or customizer, I don't even remember what his, ad, what his URL was, um, it would say, well, no, this came from the wrong site, probably wasn't, uh, he probably didn't intend to submit this form. Unfortunately, the URL referrer can be uh, spoofed using script. Um, so they stopped using that within WordPress and they started using nonces, numbers used once. It's pretty, pretty cool shortening. Um, WordPress is, whoa. WordPress's nonces are not real nonces uh, in that they're not just numbers. They're actually alphanumeric hashes. Uh, so if you see in the example above, uh, that little bit at the end is the nonce. Uh, I'll go into how to generate that. But um, it's, it's generated off of five factors. Site, the user, the time, the current time, the action being performed, and the object that the action is being performed on. Uh, changing any of these will change the nonce. So when I'm submitting an action, in this case, I'm trashing his first post, which is that ugly contact page on his website. Um, <laughs> I'm trashing it with that. That first one is a true nonce and would actually be able to trash it. But let's say I want to do trash his about page. If I use the same nonce, it's going to fail um, because the action on the about page will try and calculate, it will generate the exact same hash and know that it was false. Um, so uh, nonces can be used for a 12 hour, are used in a 12 hour rotating system where 24 hours are accepted. So for any given 12 hour period, the nonce uh, is, is the same. Um, in, in my example, uh, I would need to figure out the nonce for Openland's website uh, for doing the specific action as Openland on his website in a 24 hour period. And then I'd have to convince him to accept his free bratwurst within that 24 hours. Um, and that only applies to trashing his contact page. I'd have to start the whole process over if I wanted to do anything else. Um, to use nonces, there are a couple handy functions. WP nonce URL, which will take a URL. 
and the action that I'm trying to perform, which is, uh, and then a name. Um, so let's just go to a code example. Uh, this would be like the bare URL of uh, trashing his post. And then, um, and then the action I'm trying to perform, and what I'm going to call, uh, it's like a prefix namespace uh, name where you're trying to get as specific as possible. Uh, so it's like trash post, post ID, so it's that exact post. And then uh, the name that I'm calling it, WC Boston, trash post nonce. Um, or I could use WP nonce field. This would be more handy in like a JavaScript application where I'd retrieve this field with like, pass it to an Ajax form. Um, same same arguments essentially without the bare URL because I'm it's creating a hidden value inside of a form. So let's say this time I wanted to like delete a comment and still you know have a, a specific action name and I also have a namespaced uh, name <laughs> namespace name and it inputs this these hidden fields something along these lines into a form that when OpenLint submits this information is passed on the nonce and the action. Um, in both cases, I can test against that nonce. I can say, one, was it passed? Um, and then two, uh, can I verify that it is the same that it's supposed to be? So uh, I'm just doing uh, WP verify nonce, and then if it fails, I'm returning wah wah. And otherwise, and then the next thing. Cool. Uh, we're getting ready to take some Q&A, but First, I'd like to give a quick shout out to two amazing uh, resources when it comes to theme security, plugin security in general. Uh, the make.wordpress.org, one of my teammates created, uh, he's been writing this series on, on uh, the, the blog there uh, under the tag writing secure themes. Uh, it goes into a lot of detail on a lot of the slides that I just did. It's kind of a heavy subject, so uh, that's, you should definitely check that out. Frank is a very smart guy, a really smart developer. Um, and I'll, I'll also post these slides afterwards so that you guys can have access to this. And then AutoPress, uh, better know a vulnerability. Um, these are not theme specific. This is where like, you can learn more about like the cross-site request forgery or the SQL injection. Um, Auto is Samuel Wood, he works for Audrey and does a lot of the behind the scenes WordPress.org uh, work. And um, these two resources in general will pretty much answer a ton of questions that I won't be able to answer in the next 10 minutes. So, the end. Thanks for not walking out. I'm surprised that I think we like lost one person in 30 minutes of dense talking. I'm Michael Kane. Uh, let's take some questions. If there are any. Well, let's clap here. Oh, thank you. So about my bratwurst. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting the bratwurst, though. Yes? Another food question off topic. What's your favorite restaurant in Portland? In Portland? Oh, that's uh, my favorite restaurant in Portland. I, I guess, if you guys know, uh, Map and Menu is a food and lifestyle blog that I write with my wife, which I'm, I'm thinking someone knows in the audience here. Um, uh, Central Provisions is probably the best restaurant in Portland, but now there's... Uh, there's a seasonal place called The Well, which is on a farm, and you can eat like the food right off the farm. It's amazing. And then uh, Honey Paw, which is owned by the guys that do Eventide and Hugo's, and it's kind of like a, um, uh, it's kind of like an Asian-inspired, I don't know, small plates place that's really awesome. What was it again? Honey Paw. Honey Paw. Paw. Uh, Paw. P P A W. Sorry, I have a little bit of a southern drawl from my days in North Carolina, so. Paul sounds like Paul. Hey, Paul, how you doing? <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Food or not? Yes. Are your slides going to be up anywhere? Yeah, I'll post my slides. Um, if you follow me at Michael D. Kane, ooh, plug. Uh, I will. I'll post a cloud up link right after this is done. Yes. We were talking, I guess, mainly about themes, but can you comment a few things on plugin things that you see? Or yeah. Things so. So the question is, uh, we talked mostly about themes, but can you comment about plugins? I would say that essentially everything that was covered here applies to plugins too. Um, the, the realm of plugins is, is much greater because in general, you try and do more complex functionality with plugins. You have a lot more uh, form submissions and, um, 
and you're like querying different things like external APIs, things that you shouldn't generally do in themes, but some people probably do in themes. Uh, that's why I like didn't cover a ton of plugin stuff, but uh, standardization, validation, and intent should be practiced in any code that you write, WordPress or not. It's easy to do in WordPress because WordPress provides so many handy functions, but um, anytime that a user is submitting information, whether on the front end of your site or through the admin, um, you should be sanitizing that. That in, you should be sanitizing the input on input, and you should be. I mean, you should be validating and sanitizing on input, and then sanitizing on output. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yes. So on that same line, I, uh, I'm not a theme developer. Yep. This is kind of all new to me, but um, I I tend to have reason to use front end user submission posts, yep. which feels really risky to me, and, and I don't quite know where I should be looking to make sure that that standardization is going on, or that that kind of barrier. Awesome. So uh, she says that uh, she accept, uh, accepts a number of front end user submitted posts. I guess are, are the users submitting them and they're immediately being published as posts? Correct. Okay, so hopefully you're doing some sort of authentication um, to make sure that they're authenticated users. Well, they don't have to be. Like, you could also be sanitizing the input. So, um, it's usually through a form plugin, things like Gravity Forms, where they're, yeah. you know, in the process of creating a post, they're yeah. mapping the author to somebody who can log in. Okay. Yeah, so uh, she's using uh, Gravity Forms in, in one particular instance. Uh, I'm not sure what standardization Gravity Forms is using, but I guarantee that they are using some since they're like the fifth most popular plugin in the repository. Um, or they're not in the repository, are they? It's paid. Yeah, they're paid. Um, they're a very popular plugin. Uh, I would say that uh, anytime that you're accepting user input that's going to be created as a post, you should probably be running it through uh, WP cases post, um, which is WP underscore KSES underscore post. And that will take their input, uh, cross reference it against the allowed HTML. Um, within any post. So you know how like when you're creating uh, a post in WordPress, you're allowed to use like uh, spans, uh, links, someone help me, headers, uh, pretty much you're not, you're not allowed to use like inline JavaScript inside your post form. That's because uh, WP cases post is stripping that out. So within, uh, within the general text area, you should be comparing that against WP cases post. Um, I believe there is, does anyone know the sanitization that happens on title creation? Sanitize title? Who's saying this? Oh, nice, thanks guys. Uh, sanitize title or sanitize name. Um, I'm willing to bet that if this is part of like Gravity Forms functionality to create a post, they're, they're sanitizing it correctly. Um, so <laughs> with, with most, mm, mm, you can some you you can somewhat trust it. Uh, I would say with very popular paid plugins, uh, you can somewhat trust it. Um, with more obscured plugins, like like lesser known ones or ones done by developers, if it's in the .org repository for a plugin, uh, it has been at least uh, somewhat scanned for security vulnerabilities. The the plugin reviewers do a great job of that. Um, so I would I would say if it's part of that functionality. If you, if you haven't written custom code to create that post, I would say Gravity Forms, you're probably safe. Yeah. If you're using uh, WP Update Post or Update Post Meta, yes. and you're not sanitizing before you save those values into the database, is there any risk to your database? Uh, if you are using WP Update Post or Update Post Meta, so WP update post, I believe, fires that same WP cases filter. Um, update post meta, I don't think does sanitization by default um, on the database. So yes, you could do a cross-site um, request forgery against that. Um, Frank's third post in that uh, the tutorial that I linked to uh, covers how to properly sanitize post meta. Yeah, so um, you should definitely, if you have custom fields of, of any type, you should be sanitizing that. Um, because uh, whether, 
I mean, if you're not using the site personally, like it's very likely that a user could be tricked into submitting information that they don't want to be submitting. Yeah. Yes. It looked like um, some of the sanitization functions from WordPress were similar or duplicate the ones from PHP. Well, that's a good so question. So just best practice to use the PHP uh, the uh, WordPress ones since you're yeah. working on WordPress. Uh, so the question was, it looks like the WP functions generally look very similar to the PHP functions. I would say that there probably aren't many that match the functionality exactly, but they're rather wrapper functions. So they combine multiple PHP functions, or they com or they use a PHP function in the WordPress context. Um, so checking against things that you know should be allowed in WordPress, but don't necessarily have to be that refined in um, in the general PHP context. Um, so I would suggest if you're if you're building a WordPress app, there's no I mean, I guess there's a little bit of an overhead in using the WordPress functions, but because they're written in the context of WordPress, uh, I would use the WordPress functions. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned that we shouldn't make any assumptions, and especially if, uh, if the variable or the text might be filtered before output, we should definitely be escaping it, right? Yes. So we've been having an internal debate on our plugin development team that I'm hoping maybe you can weigh in on. <laughs> uh, let me let me just repeat what you're saying. Uh, I mentioned that you should never trust fun you should never trust uh, input, and that anything that can be filtered uh, or user submitted uh, could be an exploit. So there's a, a debate. We had the same debate in themes, so I'm excited about this. So this so here's the debate. What about yep. translation strings? Translation strings. Woo. <laughs> um, so on dot com we trust translation strings. Even though um, they can be filtered. Even though they can be filtered. Um, well, so this, there's another good example of this is uh, titles can be filtered uh, with uh, the title. Is it, Openland, is it the title or get the title? Yes. Both of them can be filtered. Um, and we don't escape those in like underscores, which is uh, kind of surprising. Uh, there, there are instances where you can uh, hope that that input was sanitized on input. Um, so for .com's translation, and I'm going to have Openland correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when we accept translations, uh, we sanitize them on input. And so we're kind of taking the, the thought that they are safe for output. I don't know within the .org context of translations. Wow. Would you escape? Well, oh, sorry. Those escape functions that, I might have skipped that slide. The escape functions that I showed, a lot of them have uh, trans internationalization wrappers. So if, um, if you want to retrieve uh, like an attribute for output in an HTML tag, you can retrieve the using. Mm. It's just it's just the internationalization function appended to the end. So it's like exactly yeah. So if you look at like uh, anything with the double underscores of the underscore e on the end of these escape functions, those are retrieving the translation and then escaping them. If if that is available, I would say go ahead and escape it. Uh, so anytime you're using it in an attribute. Uh, or in, yeah, so an attribute's a great example. I would escape it. I don't know in general though. That's a great question. What would you say? Openly? Well, on dot, in general, probably don't trust them because you don't know the translator on dot com and not dot org. We know our translators, and that's why we trust them there. Yeah. So like in core, there's like no strings are being escaped. Uh, like no translations are being escaped because we trust our translators. Will, as part of language backs, will we be trusting translators or? Uh, yes. Okay, so as part of like the language back updates where anyone can essentially uh, translate, we'll be sanitizing that on input. So we'll be trusting it. Openland says trust it, I say trust it. And if, it, if your site gets crashed, blame Moby. <laughs> yes. And I would just add to that, like, from a pure security standpoint, that trusting that, I mean, your security model that is just, you're trusting that the data is okay and it doesn't get manipulated. Good point. WordPress is interesting in that it has this model where the data that you actually expose on the front end of the site is filterable, and that's like, that's how the plugins work, that's how the whole thing works. Yeah. So that data will be changed. And there, there have been some really interesting security exploits in WordPress that operated on the assumption that data that was sanitized properly and put into the database was clean, but when that data was saved to the database, it actually got changed pretty significantly. That opened the door for a really, really nasty uh, cross-site scripting attack. 
So if you want to be super safe and you want to be really paranoid, put your uh, tinfoil hat on and say, like, escape all the escape things. Every time. Yeah. No question. Never assume anything safe. That's it. That's a great point. Um, it, hackers are really smart. Like they're they're a lot smarter than my talk. Um, so so if you want to be ultra safe, you can escape everything. Like it's not gonna hurt a lot. It's just gonna little extra server load. But no, that's it. Uh, I have two questions. We'll make them quick. Uh, is it possible to over sanitize? Where if you're sanitizing the same string repeatedly, will you basically escape your HTML to a point that doesn't make any sense? Yeah, I guess that's kind of what uh, what he was saying was if uh, the way that we were sanitizing on input in some of these really interesting cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, uh, the sanitization on input actually created the vulnerability, correct? Like it, uh, okay, yeah, so uh, the question was, can you over-sanitize? Um, yes, no, I don't, like it, you're saying if you called an escape and then you escaped it again. Yeah, that would that would be over sanitization. That I would, I would, that's why you always wait to the right before output before sanitizing. One last question. Yes. Uh, a little further on the translation. So say yeah. I have a plugin and someone comes to me and says, "Hey, here's your plugin in Russian translation." Uh, would I be there to help verify that like, I'm not telling all the Russians to do Russian through Russian? Yeah. So so back <laughs> so so back with the the, the internationalization uh, escaping. Uh, currently, when someone submits a translation to you, uh, we were the the plugin develop it, the impetus falls on the plugin or theme developer to verify that that translation. Um, I don't know how you would verify the actual text of their translation. Like it, that's always going to be an issue. Uh, I, I assume that you just have it reviewed. Um, but part of the new language packs update is that uh, we'll have like a, a community of developers, I mean a community of translators, so hopefully not all Russian translators are bad people. Um, <laughs> so, so one would see that, and like that's how .com currently works. Is like we, yeah, well that's what the question er earlier was about. Um, there, there's, there are definitely things that they could input into it, and it'd be really hard for like, let's say you have the thousand translation strings in your in your theme or your plugin, uh, you would have to manually review those to make sure that that what you are um, allowing to be translated is is good versus bad. Um, yeah. So, so go ahead and escape. Yeah. I think I'm I'm out of time. So afterwards, like. I'll be mingling around, like coming down off of this adrenaline high. Um, <laughs> and you guys are welcome to talk to me then. And yeah, thank you.